After a 15-year corporate career, Maria Brophy escaped the cubicle grind and began acting as agent and brand manager for her husband, Drew Brophy's lifestyle art brand, helping him become the top licensed surf artist in history. She is the author of the book Art Money Success and an expert in licensing, marketing, and promoting art. She also runs the Brophy Art Academy, teaching a variety of art business and mindset courses, while her husband Drew teaches art technique classes. Maria is a great example of a stardist who believes that anyone can create the amazing life they want. It just takes deciding what you want and gradually making it happen while you chip away at the things or the people that hold you back. We can't wait for you to hear this conversation and for us to dive into the seemingly taboo topic of making money. Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Okay, Maria, please forgive me this extra long intro, but I want to get the story in of how we connected. Back in episodes 91 and 92, Laura interviewed me about two large public art commissions that I was awarded. And if you haven't listened to those, shameless plug, please take a listen. In 2021, when I was first asked by the city planning department if they could license my art to place in the windows of a three-story building in downtown Paducah, of course, I was thrilled. But also, I had exactly zero idea of what or even how to charge for it. We've talked a lot on the podcast about licensing things like surface pattern design and illustration, but a three-story building? Yikes. (laughs) (laughs) So I googled pricing licensing for public art and came across an old blog post that Maria Brophy wrote, which led me to her consulting offerings on her website. I had purchased her fantastic book, Art Money Success, several years earlier. So when I saw that she offered a service to buy her lunch in return for answering my licensing question, it was the perfect situation. I sent her payment and within 72 hours, actually quite a lot less, thank you, I got a quick and perfect response. I used her advice to put together my proposal and I got the job, which led to another big commission. Woohoo! So, of course, after that, I knew we had to have Maria come on the podcast. Maria, welcome to the Stardust Society. We're so excited to chat with you today. Well, thank you. And thank you for those wonderful intros. I really appreciate it. Well, we just, you know, have to occasionally fangirl over a a guest. So we're just (laughs) thrilled to have you here. I am thrilled to be here because we're going to talk about the things I love to talk about. And I could talk about day and night. Art and money. (laughs) Art, money, and success. And success, of course. (laughs) So we always like to start our interviews by having you share your stardust story, how you got started with the career that you have and what led you to doing what you're doing now. Well, you know, it's funny. Like, I never really thought I knew what I wanted to do for a living. So I just ended up in the corporate world and I ended up in the insurance industry, nothing exciting there. And I always thought, you know, one day I'm going to figure out what I really want to do for a living. And what I realized just in the last few years is that I knew all along when I was a kid, because I think a lot of us do, we just discount it. Because when I was a kid, I always said I wanted to be the manager of a rock and roll band, Ah. (laughs) but I had no idea how to do it. And I also said I wanted to write books and I did always write. I wrote, I wrote poetry. I kept journals and I did start writing a book when I was a teenager, but I never finished it because I didn't know how to write a book. What was the book about? Was it a teenage romance? You know what? It's really funny. It was actually a great story that never got finished. It was about a teenage girl, 13 year old girl who had really big boobs <laughs> <laughs> and a father named Jimbo that was really cool. Now, it's funny because I didn't have either. I didn't have boobs. <laughs> I didn't have a cool dad. Sorry, dad. <laughs> so, you know, like you write, you write stories you want to come true. Um, 
But the way I got into the art business was when I met this really cute surfer guy named Drew in 1996, and he was painting surfboards for a living. He was a full-time artist with the most unusual job of painting surfboards and occasionally doing t-shirt design and things like that. And when I met him and I saw what he was doing, I was blown away and I was so fascinated by this lifestyle that he had because he would travel the world surfing and doing art. And really soon after meeting him, I started helping him with his marketing because I started thinking bigger, like, oh my Mm -hmm. God, there's so many things you can do with this art. I need to marry a Maria. (laughs) Well... (laughs) Well, I'm glad you said that because I want to, you know, I'm kind of, I'm going to get back to that in a couple minutes about, you know, people thinking they need a Maria, but they really don't. Absolutely. But let's get back to your story for now. So, <laughs> so anyway, I started, I started working with Drew, um, just a little bit, helping him out here and there. And then we got married and he kept trying to get me to quit my job and work with him full time. And I wanted to. But I was afraid because I knew that if I quit my job and I was making good money at my job and I had all the benefits, you know, all the stuff. Right. Um, I knew that if I quit my job, I'd start working for him and making literally zero and Mm -hmm. it would be starting from nothing. But eventually I did. Eventually, after Mm -hmm. a few years, I finally just completely left that job. And I did start making zero. <laughs> and it took, Everybody starts you know, at zero. It was, uh, oh my gosh. It was, that first year was really rough mm-hmm. because Drew was, you know, he was making enough money for himself, but he wasn't making enough money to pay me and I needed to get paid. So that was your job to figure out that part of it. (laughs) So, yeah. So over time, we figured out how to make more money, how to get leverage Mm -hmm. with his art, make more money off the same images over and over again. And that was really the, the trick. And we did figure it out. And, you know, we didn't figure everything out all at once. We figured things out over the years. And then I started teaching what I learned to other artists. And then that's how it turned into a book Mm -hmm. and online courses and coaching. So you mentioned about a turning point for you was kind of with the, the putting art on products. So I'm assuming you're referring to art licensing. Art licensing is a big part of the turning point for us. Yeah. Art licensing. And then also Figuring out how to make money off the same image again and again and again, not just through licensing, but with art prints and selling things to art collectors other than original paintings. Because when you look, one thing I realized, and this is, it's kind of a crass way of putting it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Please do. At some point. It hit me. I said, oh, my gosh, Drew, if all we do is sell an original painting and then we make the money off that one painting and then you have to paint another painting to make money again. It's like digging ditches. You're going to go out. You're going to do the work. You're going to dig the ditch. You get paid. But if you want to eat again the next week, you have to dig another ditch. Mm -hmm. And so that was the way I started looking at it. Like we have to find a way to. Take one piece of art and make money off of that over and over and over again. And that is leverage. We talk about licensing and we talk about that sort of thing. We talk, we use the word leverage too, but, um, but how did you get that going with Drew's work? Well, in the beginning, so back in like the early 2000, like the year 2000, right Mm -hmm. around there was when I started working with Drew a little bit more. I was still at my old job, but I had cut back on my hours. So I was like sort of working my way into it. Um, we had, it's funny, we were already doing licensing, but we didn't know we were doing licensing. So it was before we, we were just starting to learn, like, what does that mean exactly? Mm-hmm. Because the word itself is kind of intimidating, you know, it's like, whoa, licensing, that's 
so legalese. Like yeah. there's so many things you need to know about it. Oh my God, contracts. Yeah, contracts and like copyrights and right. negotiating and royalties and all these things. And we kind of fell into it accidentally because a lot of people were coming to Drew, a lot of small companies were coming to him saying, we love your, I love your art. We want to print your art on t-shirts. And I'm going to back up just a little bit. And, and before that, like there was a, um, there was a party we went to and there was an, an agent there who, uh, it was this guy who was the agent to one of Drew's favorite artists when he was a kid, an artist named Rick Griffin. Now, Rick Griffin had passed. He had died, wasn't that old. He died young, uh, like, I don't even think he was 50. And he mm -hmm. was from this town that we live in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we ran into his agent one night at a party. And Drew was asking the agent all these questions. And, and the best bit of advice he said to Drew, he said, look, Drew, never give your copyrights away to anybody. Because if you keep your copyrights, you can license your art and you can make money off your art over and over again. And Drew came to me and he told me what Gordon said. And he's like, well, license, like, what does that mean? And we, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So we started, you know, we just started looking into it. And we're like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a thing. It's a thing people do. And we realized that musicians do it and brands do it. You know, Disney does it. And so what we realized was that Drew had already been licensing his art that is allowing other companies to print his art on their products, but without the contract and without the royalties and just with money, um, you know, one-time payment. Leaving a lot on the table. Uh, in many cases, leaving a lot on the table. Oh yeah. And even, you know, the first few years when we started really learning about licensing and then I, there's a, there was actually a licensing school that I went to. And it was through Lima, which is the Licensing Industry Manufacturing Association. I think that's what it stands for. Cool. And it was a one-year program. And this was in the olden days before online courses. Online courses didn't exist back then. Um, so I would have to go, like, sometimes I'd have to go to L.A. Some of the classes were in L.A. And some of the classes were actually in New York at oh. the licensing show where they used to hold. Mm -hmm. that conference. And so that was where I did a lot of the live classes. Um, and that was how I learned a lot about the contracts and negotiating and how it all worked. Um, as far as the money end of it, oh, it was so frustrating. I, because I remember I, I took a class and the title of the class was royalties, advances, what to charge. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'm finally going to get answers. And I sat in the front row and this was at, you know, the, the licensing conference and I've got my notebook and I'm ready to take notes. Right. And let me guess. No answers. There are no <laughs> answers. The answer was always, it depends. It depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends. And I was just like, what? <laughs> So I started just compiling my own data on, you know, what I could get paid. And, and it does depend how big is the company? How little is the company? What are they making? How many are they making? You know, there's just so many. It is all over the board. It really is. So how did you figure it out? Just trial and error, I guess. <sighs> I am so freaking stubborn. I just never give up <laughs> on anything. And I would just make it up as I went. And, and I learned, you know, I started looking for patterns in things. And so I do have, you know, now I like, I have a process for pricing things. And it's not exactly scientific, it, but it's, you know, I, I, I don't get as stumped on it anymore mm -hmm. where I used to. Well, a lot of our listeners are just getting started, right? And licensing is new to them. They have no idea how to price their work, right? What would your advice be to somebody just getting started when they go, I got no clue? So my advice would be if they were approached by someone who wants to use their art for something Forget about the money for the first conversation. Never 
discuss money in the first conversation. First, you want to ask a lot of questions. Okay. Um, first of all, I would thank them. Say, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're interested in my art. This sounds really interesting. And can I ask you, what do you want to print it on? How many do you think you're going to make? Where do you sell these products? I mean, I just had this conversation today with a guy. Are you working with other artists? And how long have you been in business? I mean, a lot of these things you can find by looking on looking them up online. But um, how many images do you want? And mm-hmm. when do you want them? Um, you know, get a, get a really good feel for what they're planning on doing with it. Mm-hmm. And then um, with that data, so, you know, and then you determine, is this a big company? Is this a little company? Okay. The little companies, and when I say little, I mean like really small companies that are making less than a million dollars a year, you know, where they're, they're doing small volume and, you know, what you're going to charge them is going to be very different from a huge company. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you a couple examples. I mean, even though I feel like we're at a really high level now because Drew's really well known, he's very professional. He's been doing it for quite a long time. We've been doing Mm -hmm. this for so long. And um, so we can, you know, we have a lot more confidence in our charging than we did 25 years ago. Of course. And his art's gotten better and he knows more about what's going to sell and what's not going to sell and all that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to take a lot of that stuff into consideration. You know, I mean, if you're, there's a lot of things to take into consideration, but let's just say that you've been creating art long enough to where your art is good. You Mm -hmm. know that it prints really well. You are pretty sure it's going to help sell products because that's the important thing. That's why they're putting your art on their products to Mm -hmm. sell their products. Right. Then, you know, looking at a deal from a small company versus a big company. So let's say a small company could be um, a small, a a small brand where they do less than a million dollars a year. And that's pretty small. Um, They might sell 500 T-shirts, let's just say. You know, you have to do the numbers on that. They're not going to pay you $5,000 royalty or $5,000 license fee if all they're selling is 500 t-shirts. There's no, they'll lose money, right? So you have Mm -hmm. to be like kind of reasonable with the numbers. So then you have to ask yourself, and and this is what Drew and I look at. Okay, this is a small company. We can't charge them what we want because they can't pay it, right? Do we even want to bother? And a lot of times the answer is no, we don't want to bother. Um, we don't even want to bother with it because maybe we can only charge them $1,000. And is it worth it? But if this is your first chance at getting something licensed, then do you're it. in a completely different space. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Exactly. Then do it. And that's, you know, and sometimes, um, heck, I, I mean, just this year I did a deal where it was only $500. And I was kind of miffed that that was all they wanted to pay. And at first I was like, "Eh," because I knew they could pay more because this company actually does the higher volume with the product. They said, I'm not going to say what the product is because I don't want to throw them under the bus. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. Nice. They're nice people and all. But at first I was irritated. I was like, hundred dollars. What do you think we are? But then I started looking into their products and what they do. And they have a very avid fan base that is in the action sports industry. And I thought, okay, well, we're going to use existing art. I wouldn't let them use the first pick because their first pick was a newer image. And I said, no, for that amount Mm -hmm. of money, I'm not letting you use that one, but I'll let you use this other one that we've had for, you know, 15 years. And it looked great. Um, But what they brought to the table more than money for us was they introduced Drew's art to a whole new fan base because it was a... um, action sport product that Mm -hmm. drew had never had his art exposed to before so that was why we agreed to it and they were really cool people too i really liked them so we were like okay 500 bucks whatever no big deal we'll do it so maybe less up front but a potential whole new audience to open up to yeah 
and they and they have like a million TikTok followers. And so they're going to expose brand to their TikTok people. And Drew only has like 350 followers on TikTok because he's new on there. Mm-hmm. So that was really the way I, that was what was clicking for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's compensation beyond money. There's all kinds of different compensation that you have to take into consideration. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about people have come to you for opportunities, but if you're just getting started and you want to license your art, did you ever approach another company? Yeah, I've approached a lot of companies. I've approached a lot of companies and, you know, we get turned down by a lot of companies. Um, I just approached Stance, Stance Socks, and I've actually talked to them. I I know a couple of the guys that work there. It's a sock company. They're pretty big. They're great. They and they're right, they're local here. So I run into a lot of those people at parties and stuff, like locally. It, it's a small community here in San Clemente, California. Um, but the guy I talked to there was like, Well, you guys just did a license with this other company that's kind of our competitor. So mm-hmm. so no. And I was really disappointed because I don't consider that other company a competitor of theirs because they they focus on different products, but but whatever. So yeah, so <laughs> um, so yes, I do. We do approach other companies. I'll tell you a great story. Last year, Drew was doing a live painting of a surfboard at this event called the Surf Park Summit, and we wanted to do that because it was going to be all these big investors there. And we wanted to expose him to these people. And it was a three-day business event. And I love these events. And any artist listening, if you really want to meet people, and and I mean, this, this is how most of our deals come about, by the way, meeting people in person at events that you can't otherwise get a hold of people. So Drew was painting, doing a live painting there for three days. And we didn't really know hardly anybody there. Um, But this guy came up and he kept checking out the painting. And he was like, yeah, I work at a company called Ethica. And Ethica makes these really cool underwear products. And (laughs) he was like, God, Drew, I think your art would look, maybe look good on on our products. I want my art on underwear. (laughs) <laughs> it's really cool All right, i'm gonna show it to you in a minute um but maria sit down and pull your pants back up <laughs> just I, know, I thought about she that i was like she didn't do that <laughs> uh, they do make really cute ladies and cute ladies things and cute men's So these are like ladies briefs. That's adorable. So Maria, you may have to send us a photo of those so we can attach them to the show. Okay. Yeah, I will. I have a really, (laughs) I have a good picture of Drew and I holding them up. Cool. (laughs) But anyway, but this guy wasn't the right guy to talk to at the company because he didn't work in that department. He was like warehouse guy or whatever, you know, he doesn't even work there anymore. But I, I said, is there any way you can give me the name of the person that I can talk to? And so that was kind of like my end. So I had him make an introduction mm-hmm. between the guy, the guy at the top and me. And he just, I just kept bugging this guy until he finally did. I was like, because <laughs> I got his phone number and I kept reminding him like, hey, remember you were going to like send an email intro. And finally he did. And that was it. Like, here we are a year later. And just a couple of weeks ago, they dropped their in major stores right now, major department stores. Wow. It's really a big deal for us. And they're it's it's a great company. Awesome. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely it's definitely helpful to be out there getting to know people. I mean, I've gotten I've gotten my best gigs by just people knowing about me from meeting them out like that. Mm hmm. But and I know that you talk about in-person events and networking and making connections like that a lot in your book, which was written before COVID. And um, has COVID changed any of that for you? I mean, I know for a couple years, Drew's situation aside, with the world shutting down for a year or two and opening back up again, has that landscape changed? Are there as many in-person opportunities as there used to be? Or how has that changed for you? 
Well, definitely during the the first two years of COVID, right? Everything was like everything went dead, um, and that was a real bummer. In some ways, I mean, that was a really awful time for everybody. But I, I see everything's to in my world, everything's one hundred percent back to normal. So I don't know if maybe there's other parts of the world where things are not, but. You know, I mean, people are doing more things online than they used to, mm-hmm. but people are so tired of doing things online. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I find that when you are at an event, like a conference mm-hmm. for multiple days, you make friendships with people that you can't in any other way. Yeah. Are you still finding as many of those happening? Because I've seemed to notice that some things that, shut down during COVID, never came back, and some things went online and just stayed online that used to be live events and now are virtual events. Are you not finding that affecting you at all? Um, it doesn't affect me, no. Um, I, I agree, though. Yeah, there are a lot of things that, that canceled and mm-hmm. just never came back, mm-hmm. and that's a bummer because some of them were things for artists, you know. Right. There's always a million things going on. True. So, any artist listening, if you live in a big city or near a city or within driving distance of a city, and when I say driving distance, I mean even five hours, okay? Mm-hmm. I don't mean five minutes. I mean, like, <laughs> if you can get in your car and drive there, it counts. Yeah. Every town has things going on. And I don't try to get involved in things that have to do with art because I find There's more success if there's no other artists around or very few artists. Ah, Hmm. Interesting. That makes total sense. Like, give us an example of of a type of event like that that you think would be successful for someone. Okay. I'll give you a great example of something that Drew and I did for years and years and years. There's a trade show called the Surf Expo. Has nothing to do with art. It's all... Companies selling clothing and surfing products and and Mm -hmm. even um, scuba gear, you know, anything to do with water sports. Right. And and it's in Florida. It's nowhere near where we live. And many for many years, um, we would go to that trade show and we would team up with a company Mm -hmm. that had a booth and we would say, Hey, um, let Drew come and do a live painting in your booth. It'll draw people to your booth and it will enable Drew to meet people. And that was how he developed so many relationships with so many companies in that industry. Just by being there doing live paintings. That's a great idea. You know, that's that's amazing. But clearly Drew built his career on a very focused niche. Yeah. And a lot of us are a bit scared of niching down and we kind of don't really know where to begin. So how can an artist identify and sort of laser focus on their target market? Well, um, so give me an example of something. I mean, okay. so if you're an artist and you're not working within a niche, but let's Mm -hmm. say you paint flowers on some days and portraits on others and dogs on other days. Right. Okay. I think that's me. Uh, yeah. Okay. She's looking at you, Laura. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So choose one of those themes. Right. Dogs are the easiest. Easiest. And you look at the town nearest you, the city nearest you, and start looking for dog events. You know, there's all kinds of pet conferences trade shows. I mean, there, there's so many things going on like any given week with dogs. A vet conference. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then, okay. And then what I would do next is I'd get on the website of the conference and I'd look up all the vendors and I'd start looking for the vendor that has the most boring product. Okay. And okay. Let's say a vendor that sells to pet insurance. <laughs> How do they get people in their booth? They are boring. So boring, right? <laughs> so here you are. You call them up and you go, look, I'm an artist. 
I, I want to reach companies in this industry. And what I'd like to offer is let me display some of my art in your booth. Let me do a live painting in your booth. Let me give away an art print of a dog portrait to one of your customers. And um, you'll benefit from it. And I'm going to benefit from it. That's actually really brilliant. Yeah. And it works. And then if they say no, look for the next boring company. Um, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't have to be a boring company, but something like insurance, they need all the help they can get. <laughs> or <laughs> and um, you can say that because you worked in insurance. <laughs> yeah. And I used to set up my insurance company booth at trade shows. And man, my booth was the most boring booth. That's because you weren't modeling Drew's underwear. <laughs> I, know. I know. And back then I could have gotten away with it. I could have totally gotten away with it. Back in the good old days. Um, so that is, it works. I've, we've done it many times. That's, it's such brilliant advice, but I have a question for you. Yeah. Not everyone feels comfortable in big crowds, meeting people they don't know. There's a lot of introverted artists out there. What about them? How do they approach something like this? How do they find their first company to license to? How do they find their first collectors even when they're when they're brand new and they don't necessarily have that confidence to or the desire to be social and be in groups? I know the answer to that, Laura. <laughs> what is it? Bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Nikki has to say bourbon in every episode. Um, Nikki's coffee cup that you might see her drinking out of has bourbon in it, not coffee. Oh, that sounds good. I'm drinking tea. Well, come to Kentucky. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And I'm going to do that Kentucky bourbon. There's like a bourbon, the bourbon trail. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'll take you. We'll go in the bus. I would love to do that. I would. Okay. But if you actually are an introvert, which I clearly am not that much of one, but. <laughs> well, okay. So I got a couple of things to say about that. First of all, I married an introvert, but when you meet him, you wouldn't know he's an introvert because he's taught himself how to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I made him give a live talk to an audience of a hundred people. Oh, that's cruel and unusual punishment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one, probably really good for him. One day it hit me. If he could speak to audiences and do like live paintings and talk about the painting, mm -hmm. we could sell more art. Mm -hmm. Like it hit me. And right. then he's like, I'm not going to do that. And I go, well, I'm going to book it. I'm going to book you at this <laughs> trade show to give a talk. I said, you can do it. And I made him do it. And he was so nervous. And I'll never forget, we were both nervous. But I'm watching him and I'm like biting my nails. Because I always had a fear of public speaking too. Which is why you made him do it. <laughs> I, was, I was feeling the pain right along with him. But he he did great. I mean, he was really nervous. And I remember his like mouth was getting really dry. And he was like, stuttering but then after like 10 minutes he 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 got in the groove and he started agreeing to do it more and more and he got better and better at it and more and more comfortable and now I can put him in a, in front of 500 people and he'll get nervous but he'll do it he'll do it and he'll do okay so this is the perfect place to ask if we don't have a maria <laughs> to kick you in the butt to kick us in the butt and sign us up for things you do have me to kick you in the butt i'm kicking <laughs> you in the butt right now i'm telling you i'm telling you look okay so so there's no magic potion <laughs> i can't Damn give it. you this magic elixir maybe the bourbon has a little bit wait but i'm drinking it yeah <laughs> the, there's a little bit in the bourbon but you've really look look everything you want is on the other side of your comfort zone and that is no cliche. That is a God's honest truth. And I've had to deal with it myself. Well, cliches exist for a reason. Yeah. I mean, okay. So introverts, um, I, I know a lot of introverted artists. I mean, heck, I think most artists are introverted. Mm -hmm. I have so many friends who are professional musicians mm -hmm. that are afraid on stage, but they do it anyway. 
Um, it's it's really astounding to me. You have to get it out there. Yeah, they they can't make their music with. I mean, they can make their music without going live. Yes, they can, but they're less. They're not going to build a fan base hiding in the closet because people want to make that connection. The connection is so important. And all right, so for for all of you shy people, I have a advice. I have a tip for you. It's not advice. It's a tip that helped me and it could help you. Okay. It could help you get out of your head a little bit. And that is when you're feeling shy, you're feeling uncomfortable, uncomfortable in your own skin and you're feeling awkward. And we, we all have those moments, some of us more than others, but, um, It's because you have to realize why you're feeling that way. It's because you're thinking about yourself. What do I look like? How do I sound? What are they thinking of me? Do I look stupid? What am I even doing here? You know, like it's all these thoughts. But if you can take a moment and shift from me, me, me to there's people here that actually want to get inside my head because they're fascinated by the art that I do. Because there are people out there that think that artists are magical unicorns and they just want to know more about it. Well, we are. (laughs) You are. Magical unicorns. Magical unicorns. Absolutely. And you're, (laughs) you're giving people the gift of insight when you talk to them about your art, when you answer their questions. And, you know, the questions are always the same old question. How long did it take you to paint that? Mm -hmm. Where do you come up with your ideas? You know, it's Mm -hmm. it's the same questions over and over again. But the people asking those questions, they genuinely are so intrigued by what you do. And it's a gift for them. Well, we don't realize, I think, a lot of times what comes really easily for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can draw from the minute I wake up until the minute I go to bed and never run out of ideas and never get tired of it. And, you know, what's second nature to me is really foreign and fascinating to other people. And we forget about that. Right. So we don't I, I don't think we have to be the most eloquent people in the world. We don't have to have something profound to say. People just want to they want to hear about it. Yeah. And, and you might just be talking about your process. Well, I get up in the morning and I do this and then I do that. And to you, it's boring because you do it every day. But to somebody else, it's fascinating. So just make yourself do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> look, the alternative is, here's the alternative to, to that, is that if you want to, you know, you can reach people through TikTok and Instagram and all these online platforms. And you can. And, and some artists are really good at that. But really, if you want to sell art, you have to reach people on a deeper level. You have to reach buyers, people with money that are going to buy art. And the way to make that connection, the best way to make that connection is in person at art shows or at events. Otherwise, you just you're just going to spend so much time trying to do it online and meeting people in person. It's just another way to do it. Okay, so let's say you meet somebody in person, you have a connection with them, then what? Well, you want to uh, make sure that you get in touch with them, you stay in touch with them. So using that example from a year ago, we were at that surf park summit and we met this guy named Darren and he was my in, you know, he was our in into that company. And um, I got his phone number and I'm like, can I have your number? And I put it in my phone and usually like the rule of thumb is you want to reach out to somebody within 24 hours after meeting them. So before they forget you. <laughs> yeah. And it's, a, it's so simple. It's just you just send them a text or a message through Instagram or however you message it. There's a million ways to message people these days. And um, you just send a message saying it was so great to meet you. And and hey, if in one of the conversations that you had with them they, there was something they showed interest in and you know of a video that they'd be interested in. You send them a link to that, you know, just like send them something that has nothing to do with you, nothing to do with, you know, it's, it's a gift you're giving them. Oh, you said you were, you were interested in learning more about how to do this one thing. Well, here's a video I watched. It's really good. 
there's a link. So that's how you connect with people. You you give, mm-hmm. you be of service in a tiny way, stay in touch, and don't be afraid to ask for help with something. People actually love to help as long as it's not taking up a huge amount of their time. Yeah, some people do love to help. It makes them feel important. And if they like you, if they connect it with you, they want to help you. So that's the other thing is don't be afraid to ask for something. And it's not like you have to go in for the kill and go, (laughs) oh, I want to do this big thing with your company. You can say, you know what? I love the stuff that your company does. I'd Mm -hmm. love to one day collaborate. Use Mm -hmm. the word collaborate Mm -hmm. because that's a fun word. Yeah. And working together rather than a transactional thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you plant the seed in their mind. You plant the seed. You let them know. Because people don't know that. Don't assume that they know what you want because nobody knows what you want except you. True. So one of the things you mention, I think you talk about this a bit in your book, is around systems. Are there systems that you recommend? Is there like one one item or one system or one action that you think people should be taking um, when it comes to pricing money? Yes. So try to have a little bit of structure around the way you price things. And there are so many pricing structures I have around what we do. So we sell original paintings. Mm-hmm. We have a price structure around that mostly broken down by the square inch Mm -hmm. with like a sliding scale. So the bigger the painting gets, the square inch cost goes down, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Another way you can do pricing with painting, just as an example, if you find that you're painting, mostly painting like three specific sizes, have a specific price for each size. You know, if you paint a 24 inch by 24 inch painting, you know that you're going to charge $2,500 for that size. I don't know, making up numbers here, but you know, and then you go up to the next bigger size and you know that that's 3,500. And then the next bigger size is 5,500. And the great thing about having that structure is then in a conversation when you're talking to someone, and this happens all the time with artists who are getting known for what they do, you'll have somebody say, oh, I want, I'd love to commission you to paint this. How much would it cost? Well, that's a big question. How much? Well, what do you want? You want a painting this big or you want a painting this big? But you can answer with, well, um, it depends on size and complexity, but in general, here's the three main sizes. Mm -hmm. And here's my three prices. And, you know, if there's something you want at a different size, I can price that out for you. So that way it kind of rolls off your tongue. Or if it's way more complex than the usual stuff I do, that sort of thing. Yeah, then I'll add to the price. Like Also, commissions, in my opinion, need to be significantly more than just buying a painting that I did on my own. Because you're working to somebody else's ideas and there's a lot more back and forth. So... There's a lot more that goes into it than just buying a painting that I've already made. (laughs) Well, yeah. And some artists just hate doing commissions, but they do them because they have to. Yeah. And yeah, I know, I know a lot of artists that charge like 20% more for a commission. Well, I think that's very reasonable. That's fair. Yeah. Because twice in my life had a commission that was, I want exactly what you do. So just do it. And that's a beautiful thing. But usually it's like, I want exactly what you do, but change it to this totally different thing. And then add my <laughs> dog in there and then add my motorcycle in there. And then can you add this symbol in there? Because yeah, like it means one, something to me. And then and then they want you to add all this stuff in. Here's a funny example at um, at an art festival that we have here in Paducah, Kentucky. I was drawing, this was, I don't know. 15 years ago, I was drawing on my car and I was drawing nude women and florals. And this guy just watched me for the longest time and was like fascinated by it and said, I would really like to hire you to draw a fighter plane on my truck. (laughs) What part of this makes you think I want to do that? 
best. <laughs> oh my gosh. So sometimes you just say no. <laughs> we get the wackiest requests. This guy brought us an ostrich egg for Jigger Paint. That's a whole art. People like, yeah. like engrave and cut them. It's cool, but you know how hard it is to paint a round object? I do. I do yeah. because I I did somebody's um, motorcycle helmet once. Oh yeah, yeah. Drew Drew did a couple of those in the past. He won't do those anymore. There, there was a time where he'd paint anything. You brought him anything, he would paint it. But now he's he's older. Now he's he's older. Now he's like no. Now he's learning how to say no. Well, that's good. Saying no is a really good skill to learn. It is, or you know, an even better skill is to steer people towards what you want to do. Yes. So I try not to use the word no. Mm -hmm. In general, I try not to ever say no, unless I'm fighting with someone and I'm just like, no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yes, if they can be steered. But I really don't think that guy wanted a nude woman on the side of his truck. He really wanted a fighter plane. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it's like I, I I do like try to steer people towards, OK, well, he's probably, you know, that's probably not going to work because of whatever. But how about this? Yeah. And I like to if, if I can, if it's something that I'm not suited for or don't want to do, we'll try to make a recommendation of somebody else who, you know, that's not my area of expertise. But have you looked at this person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Funny. So when it comes to pricing and success and money, uh, what mindset shifts do you think are really essential for artists to transition from sort of seeing themselves as just creators to being entrepreneurs and becoming in, you know, successful? And we can talk about what does successful even mean? Well, first of all, success is whatever makes you happy. So, I mean, of course, money needs to be a part of that if you're relying on your art to support you. You don't have to rely on it to support you. You can choose to do something else for a living and let your art just be your side hustle, and that's fine. Um, But even regardless of whether you're a full-time artist or a part-time artist, you still should be paid. So the mindset thing You know, that word mindset is so cliche now, but it absolutely uh, drives your actions. It drives your words. It drives your pricing and how you handle things Mm -hmm. when it comes to money. So if you have a poor money mindset, if you're so how do you know if you have a poor money mindset? I'll give you a few examples. And this is just off the top of my head. If you complain about money a lot. Mm -hmm. You have a poor money mindset. Money is running your life. And it's because of the way you think about money. Okay. And you can shift that. Okay. If you choose to. Um, You also have a poor money mindset if you consistently underprice your value. Now, how do you know what your value is? Mm -hmm. You know. You know. You know what your value is. You know what your work is valued. You get a gut feeling. You know when you're underpricing yourself. You have a poor money mindset if you've been taken advantage of more than a couple of times. It's your fault because you aren't taking care of things because of your mindset. And the good news is you can shift that and you can fix that so that it never happens again. And Don't take these strong words coming out of my mouth as being judgmental because I've done this. I've been there. I grew up poor. I grew up with a very bad money mindset and I worked on it and worked on it, worked on it until I completely shifted it. And I'm still working on up leveling it because once you shift it, when you make a big shift, Mm -hmm. you see the results of it in more money flowing into your life. And when you make that big shift and you actually do it, the money actually starts flowing in pretty quick. And then you're shocked. and You're like, whoa, where, is, where has this been all my life? Why didn't I do that sooner? <laughs> <laughs> and then you're shocked 
I, I have had experiences like that before. I remember once I, I wanted to go on this trip to Paris to see this art exhibit and I didn't have the cash and I kind of shifted a money mindset and somebody came to me and said, I want you to, to create some custom jewelry with my artwork in it. And I literally priced it out at exactly what I needed to go to Paris and I got the deal. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. That is the best story ever. <laughs> and I wrote about this in my book, not your story, but that <laughs> that knowing how much you need. OK, your story right there is like it illustrates the magic behind deciding how much money you want to make every month. Now, not deciding some crazy number, like mm -hmm. if you're only making three hundred dollars a month in sales. And, and for some artists, that's really good. But I'm just making up numbers here. Don't say, well, I want to make $100,000 a month because that's a little crazy. Your mindset won't even allow you to shift with that number that's so far to reach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're making 300 a month and you're like, OK, I want to make 1000 a month. Now, that's a leap because it's more than double, but it's very doable and you write this down and you're like, okay, this is what I want my monthly income to be. And then you break it down into weeks and that's 250 a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to make $250 a week? Well, I need to sell one art print or one little tiny painting or one, whatever, right? Um, the decision that this is going to be your focus. This is how much money you're going to make every month. And you start taking action towards it. And then when somebody comes to you or when you're you're setting up at a trade show, you're in a you're in a position where you're selling art mm -hmm. and you've got somebody who says, um, I want to commission you to do this or I want to buy one of these things from you. And it's two hundred fifty dollars. But, you know, the month is almost over and you still have five hundred dollars to go to meet your goal. And you're going to say to that person well, why don't you buy two? It's only $500. And the person says, okay. And you're like, oh my God, that was so easy. Or like for me, because I, I have a set amount of money that we have to make every month. And I pay attention to it every week. I'm looking at the numbers. Drew and I look at the numbers together. And if we're coming up short and the month is, you know, almost over, we start going, okay, what are we going to do? We start clicking. We start looking, making a plan. What event is there? What painting do I have? Who can I call that right. showed interest in a painting? And I actually have a list on my, on my wall of like people to call that showed interest. And I might call five people and one person says, yeah, you know what? I was just thinking about this the other day. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to buy now. And then boom, we met our monthly goal. But there's magic in having that number, knowing how much you need and then making exactly that amount. Well, and, and I do believe a lot in sort of the law of attraction. Um, I'm, I'm the woo-woo side of this, this podcast <laughs> partnership. Nikki, Nikki is not. But, um, but I also like what you were talking about, sort of your mindset generates action, right? So... It's not just all woo woo in just that if you if you shift your mindset on things, you actually take action and, and take action in alignment with that. Things will happen for you. Right. But also on a really, really practical side of it, the fact that you actually know this is exactly the amount of money I need to bring in every month, every week to make my bills and meet my goals and figure out how to actually do that. <laughs> That's where I'm lacking. I actually need help on the figuring out the whole financial <laughs> side of it and the planning and budgeting. Laura has a day job in finance. <laughs> She's good at that part. Yeah, the, the money part isn't as big for me. I'm really good at spending money and wondering where it all went. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us are. I need to work on the figuring out what I actually need to make. But the other side of that, though, is if you're getting to the end of the month, for some people, that could be really um, scary or frustrating or intimidating or like, oh, my gosh, now I'm desperate. Like, 
So part of the mindset thing, I think, is also is what if this was a game? What if this was a game of this is how much money I'm making this month? And what could I do? What game could I play to get to that end result without having it to be like a super serious, um, I guess, stress inducing type thing, right? Yeah. Well, that, that was what I did. I did a couple of things to overcome my mindset. And one of them, I worked with a, co- a coach and she taught me this. Um, she said, make it fun. Every time you catch yourself saying, I can't afford this, I can't afford that, retrain your brain and say, oh, I have all the money I need and make jokes about it because you know that's not true right now. <laughs> so you make a joke and then you laugh at yourself. And so I started, I got the habit. And I started doing it and two things happened. One, I noticed that a million times a day I was thinking to myself, I can't afford this. I can't afford that. You know, like I couldn't believe how many times I had negative thoughts about money and I had never noticed that before. The second thing was that I started saying out loud, it's a good thing I'm rich. And I remember um, one, one day we had a problem with one of our tires on our van. So I took it to the tire shop and the guy looked at all my tires and he's like, yeah, you need all four tires. Like this is dangerous. You can't drive around (laughs) like this. And I was like, well, how much is that going to cost? And he said, $1,800. And that was a lot of money. And I didn't have that money, but I had a credit card. I could put it on but I made a joke out of it. So there was a guy behind me in line and I said, well, (laughs) it's a good thing I'm rich because that's nothing to me, even though it was, right? (laughs) And the guy in line behind me was like, wow, I wish I was rich. And it was funny. And I just started having fun with it, but it's doing that practice started shifting. It started shifting for me. And then I did start taking action as if I was going to be successful with things. And then I did something really crazy. And um, the crazy thing was... You bought a school bus? Oh, wait, no, that's me. (laughs) I wish I would have bought a school bus. I might buy one. It's not too late. (laughs) I might buy one. I want to buy one already decked out because I'm just terrible at decorating. And I want it to look cute. Oh, that was the fun part for me. (laughs) <laughs> See, I'm terrible at that. I'm just like, oh, just give it to me, ready to go. With all ready with the cute curtains and all the stuff. I'll design it for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right, you're on. I'm coming out. We're gonna drink bourbon and you're gonna you're gonna decorate my bus. <laughs> yes. Actually, I'm coming out to you. I'm coming out west. Okay, good. Anyway, you were saying. Okay, so um, so then I so this was 2016 when I was really starting to shift. Mm-hmm. my mind on things and 2015, 2016. And then um, there was this online course I'm trying to remember the name of it. Okay. You guys, it costs so much money. And I, we probably both bought it <laughs> knowing <laughs> us. I really wanted to do it because it was like, it wasn't for artists. It was for entrepreneurs that, um, wanted to see themselves, wanted to present themselves as high value providers. And it wasn't Marie Forleo, was it? No, no, (laughs) I never. It wasn't B-School, was it? (laughs) No, it was not B-School. No, I wouldn't. I don't think I would have made it through B-School, but (laughs) um, no. And it was, it was a $7,000 course. Now. That's hefty. It's, you know what? super hefty, crazy. But the guy teaching the course, like I had watched a lot of his videos. I've read some of his books. I was just sold on this idea that there were secrets in this course that would help me work with some of the, like, like charge more and like learn the secret language to charge more money with some of the corporate clients that we had that Drew was creating illustrations for. Mm Mm-hmm. So I took the course and I didn't tell Drew. Drew would have killed me if he knew how much money I spent on the course. Wait, does he know now? I had, well, I'll tell you the story. Because can we blackmail you now? I had, to put it, I had to put it on a couple different credit cards, but I 
took this course and like soaked up every single lesson. And I learned, I did learn some secrets that helped me. And it, the timing was perfect because this really big company came to us and they wanted to hire Drew to do all these illustrations for this new brand. Mm-hmm. Now, normally for illustrations for a brand, um, for a company like this, we would have charged like $4,000 for an illustration, right? But I realized what this company wanted was, uh, well, there are a couple of things I realized. One, this company was giant. It was the biggest company we ever did business with. Like I knew that they had already gone to an advertising firm to do the illustrations. And after a year, it failed. Hmm. So, you know, they already paid a ridiculous amount and didn't get what they wanted. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. They had a full art department and their art department couldn't give them what they wanted. Wow. And so that's knowing your value. One guy at the company was convinced that Drew's style was perfect. So knowing this and that I had just taken this course and I learned like all these buzzwords, put the proposal <laughs> in there. Like I did something crazy and I quoted them for their one illustration, $16,000. And it was the most that I had ever quoted for anything at that time. And they said, yes, didn't even question it. Wow. And then, um, so then. Oh, dang, I should have said 25. <laughs> but it paid, that paid for the course. Look, think about that. Right. And then some. And then that some. That paid for it twice. And then some. Yeah. Then, so we got that first illustration underway and then they were, then they were like, okay, this guy can do what we need him to do. And they needed 30. Oh my God. 30 wow. illustrations. And so then, but they, they. Wait a second. I can draw in Drew's style. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So you guys aren't going to believe this, but so then I worked it out where like we ended up getting, so I upped the price mm-hmm. and we ended up getting, uh, oh my God, so much money from this. And, and they were happy. They were super happy. Um. We ended up like by the end, it was ended up being a two year project. We ended up Mm -hmm. getting like $24,000 in illustration. Wow. And so the price just kept going and they had no problem with it. And the reason, like I had reasons for upping the prices, like sometimes they would get really complicated and I, and um, things would just take way longer because Mm -hmm. they would get micromanaging and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they had no problem with it. But if I had never done the money mindset work I was doing, Mm -hmm. and if I had never taken that course and taking that course, oh, and going back to the price of the course, Drew said, he kept saying, yeah, how much was that course? (laughs) And I kept being like, oh, 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 wait a minute. Are we going out to dinner with our so-and-so Saturday night? (laughs) Like I just kept changing the subject. Nice. (laughs) And it was funny, like six months later. When we saw, he couldn't, like, we were both shocked at what we were able to make. Right. So he really couldn't criticize it at that point. No. He was like, I can't believe you spent that much money on that course. But hey, it worked. It paid (laughs) off. It did. So speaking of courses, I would love to hear a bit about, so you started with your book, I believe before you did any online courses. I would love to hear how the book came about. Um, We own the book, we've read the book, but I'd love to hear in your words, a little, like a summary of the book and how that came to be. And then how that led into the courses that you're now teaching, because I see that you're going, going heavy, promoting the courses on social media. And it was all I could do not to buy it earlier today. (laughs) But I've promised myself I'd finish all the courses I've already bought before I buy another one. (laughs) But anyway, I'd love to hear that progression from just supporting Drew's career and growing his career to the book, to the courses, 
and all of that. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to say I don't promote my courses hardly ever. And it my bad. But but last week I did go on like a well, it's five whole, day blitz. Yeah. Of, the Black Friday, uh, Cyber Monday thing. Yeah. And I yeah. and it was just I I decided to discount it for five days, which I never do. I never discount it. But my courses I don't charge enough for my courses. I should like quadruple the price. No, your prices are pretty amazingly reasonable. They are. And the reason, so going back to your original question, how did I get into writing the book and all that? I love helping people. I mean, that is what I do. And I've always been that way. And I always saw myself like, I, I always saw myself as being like a dear Abby because I love when I figure something out for myself. I love to share it with other people. And when I started figuring out, you know, when Drew and I, you know, and I say me, but it was he and I together figuring out this business of art thing. And we figured out how to make money, how to raise kids at the beach, you know, in a very expensive place to live and how to survive the ups and downs of the art business and the economy and all that stuff. And artists always came to me for advice. They would go to Drew for advice, but he's not, he doesn't mind sharing, but he, he's not as good at teaching like the details of how things are. It's like all in his head. I'm a natural teacher. Let me draw. Go ask my wife. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. He's like, ask Maria. She'll, she'll explain it way better than me. And it's kind of like if he takes you out to teach you how to surf He'll take you out in the big waves and then he'll go, yeah, just paddle and stand up and catch it. <laughs> oh, is that all? <laughs> and then you get clobbered and almost die and never want to do it again. Note to self, don't ask Drew to teach me to surf. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I, I just love teaching people. And, I'm, and I think I'm good at teaching things because I analyze everything. And so with the analyzation, I can tell you for detail, like why something worked and why something didn't work. And so I started writing a blog because I, I had so many artists coming to me for advice that I got tired of talking to people all the time. And so in 2009, I said, OK, I'm just going to start answering all these questions in a blog. And my blog got really popular. Then I started coaching artists just on the side. And I still do, but really, really part time because I don't have a lot of time to I, I'm running this art business still, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, that's the other question is how do you fit all of this stuff in? I but. don't know. I, I work too much. <laughs> I don't know how I do it. Yeah. Uh, if you ask my husband, he'd tell you uh, she's, you know, getting by by the skin of her teeth. I don't, it's like <laughs> she's got all these balls in the air and she's letting half of them fall. That's what he'll tell you, which is probably true. But um, <laughs> OK, I don't feel so bad then. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, I do way too many things all at once. But you know what? It works for me and I'm okay with that. Right. I used to try not to be all over the place and I finally accept that about myself. I'm working on that. I am very ADHD. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why it took me years to finish this book, Art, Money, Success. I wrote it. I started writing it probably in 2010. And then I finally published it in 2017. Mm-hmm. How crazy is that? It took me that long. And I bought it in 2018, which I realized because I went back and looked at my Amazon account to see when I got it. <laughs> and I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of my book because. Yeah. So tell us how it came about. Well, it just so many people were asking me and I started answering and I and I had I had written so many blog posts about so many things. And then finally, I just started putting it all in a book. And like I mentioned earlier, my dream as a kid was to be an author. Mm -hmm. And I did always dream of myself being a novelist, but I realized I'm not good at writing novels. Mm -hmm. I, I have a great imagination, but I'm not very good at writing it down. I'm good at writing how to do something. That I'm good at because I analyze things and I'm really good at breaking it down into easy to follow steps. So that's why my book is so popular it's got over 600 five-star reviews on Amazon. It's been on the Amazon bestseller list many times. That's amazing. And I'm really, I am very proud of it because I get thank you messages almost every day from somebody. That's fantastic. One woman wrote me, she's, um, 
I forget. She's from an Asian country, relocated. I forget which country she's from, but she relocated to Canada. And she wrote me and said, because of your book, I am now making $10,000 a month off my art and supporting my entire family. That's amazing. That's great. So in your book, you cover. Okay. So I, I do cover mindset. Like we talked about, mm-hmm. I go into pricing, mm-hmm. how to sell art, how to actually sell art, how to connect with people. Your network is your net worth. That's one of the chapters. If you need a cash mm-hmm. flow infusion in your business, I have a whole chapter on what to do, how to get money quick. Mm-hmm. How to work with galleries. I have mm-hmm. one chapter on licensing your art. It doesn't go real into detail because it's just one chapter, but it skims the surface and gives you a general understanding. One of the chapters that I'm, I think will help a lot of artists is how to deal with charities. I think if, if you were to ask me, what are the parts of my book that have made the biggest difference in artists' lives? I would say the first couple chapters where I guide you in a journaling exercise to write down what you want. And I give you a number of prompts to answer these questions. Um, There's another chapter in there that walks you through pricing and setting your money goals and how to use those money goals to price things out. I think that really helps artists that are not sure how to do it. I'm not sure how to deal with the money part of it. Actually, Maria, I just discovered when we were doing some research to to prep for this, that there's a PDF out there that's worksheets to go along with the book. Do you mind if we share that with our listeners? Please share that with your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. She's got a great PDF that's, that's, it's, a little, a little workbook that talks you through some of these things that she's mentioning. So we'll share that with you in the show notes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, and you can do the exercises even without the book. Well, of course we recommend the book. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, and I have some artists that want to set up a coaching call with me. My coaching calls, my, my short calls, $85 for 20 minute, $175 for, I say 45 minutes. We always go an hour. But um, very reasonable. Uh, some mm-hmm. artists, I, I tell them, look, just spend $20 on the book. Mm-hmm. And then if you still need the coaching call, we'll do the coaching call. But the book, it's changed so many people's lives. Now, if somebody does want to go more in depth on something, then this is where the courses come in? Yes. So I have a number of courses. Um, one of them is art licensing. And that was the one I was promoting pretty hard last week. And that's the one that that probably the majority of our listeners are looking for. That's that's kind of the way our audience, we, we have a variety of, of listeners. Some are more fine artists, some are more interested in licensing, but I think that a lot of people will be interested in this course. So if anybody wants to look it up while you're listening, um, you can look up brophyartacademy.com and then click on the business course tab and you can look at the descriptions. But basically, so I have three different courses and I sell them individually and as a bundle. Mm -hmm. And I did that because the first course just gives you the general overview of art licensing. And I thought, you know, some artists might just want to learn how it works, but they don't want to go deep into the next course, which is, uh, my joke is, I basically hold your hand and lead you to get your next licensing deal. If you do everything step by step, you're going to be guided to your next licensing deal. And one of the things I have you do is go to small companies in your local area to get practice and small companies are sometimes the the best types of companies to collaborate with because they need you as much as you need them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a win, 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 and it's easier to get in with a small company. Some examples would be like a wine company or a beer brewery Mm -hmm. or a 
a small um, gift store that prints their own products. There are so many opportunities for art licensing and a lot of people just don't even realize it. Yeah, actually, that's really good advice. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a town these days that doesn't have a local brewery Mm -hmm. that comes out with a new beer all the time and needs a label for it. Yeah, exactly. I'm in a little small town in Western Kentucky and we've got two breweries. So (laughs) hit, hit one up. Hey, yeah, up? yeah. So how long have you had these courses out there? So let's see, I started the art licensing course. Um, gosh, when did I come out with that? A couple of years ago. I think I came out with my, my first course in 2019. And that one is all about how to do art exhibits. And it's called Art Exhibits That Sell. And anybody that takes that course It's not just about doing our exhibits at galleries because I recommend not doing them at galleries. Um, I I don't recommend against it, but I I, tell us more about that. There's, oh my gosh, there are so many different ways to do art shows. Um, You can do, you can do an art show at, well, you could do them at a trade show, like a five day trade show. You Mm -hmm. could do an art exhibit at somebody's home, somebody who has a large home that loves to entertain to their wealthy friends. There are uh, people that do that. You could do it at a real estate brokerage firm, a Mm -hmm. luxury real estate office where they sell luxury real estate. You could team up with a company. um, Oh my gosh, there are just so many there's so many possibilities. Those are all really great ideas. Hotels, boutique hotels. So in the course, I tell you how to do this. And I give you lots of examples of artists that have done it and how it works. And it, it's it's just such me. There, there are so many ways to do it away from art galleries. And in my opinion, you'll make more money because a lot of the Places that you can do an art show with that's not an art gallery, they don't even want any of the money. They, there's other things they get out of it. I love that. So, Maria, where can our listeners connect with you online? Okay, so let's see. I have, talk about being scattered. I actually have two websites, and I'm trying to figure <laughs> that out right now. One is mariabrophy.com. Well, if you need to hire a professional website designer, I happen to know one. <laughs> <laughs> I need to I just need to like figure out how to connect them. Yeah, yeah. anyway, that's a, it's yeah. a whole thing. I get it. It's a whole thing cuz you know when you're evolving mm-hmm. and I've been evolving the last few years, but okay, so mariabrophy.com that's my blog. Um there's a lot of information there. And then if you go to brophyartacademy.com that's where all my courses are. Mhm. And then if you're on Instagram, I love Instagram. I'm an Instagram junkie. So it's just my (laughs) name on Instagram, Maria Brophy. I'm also on TikTok. I don't use it that often, but sometimes I do. Um, We'll link to all of these in our show notes. Thank you. Of course. So Maria, thank you so much for being on the show today. This was awesome. Um, It's got ideas kind of spinning in my head of ways that I might be able to promote my art and sell my art and price my art and have a better money mindset. Oh my gosh, so many ideas. Thank you. <laughs> to learn more about Maria and read today's Stardust Society show notes, go to stardustsociety.com slash Maria Brophy. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. Reviews help us reach more Stardusts like you and keep us inspired to create new episodes. Maria, thanks so much for coming on. And to our listeners, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you.